started in a shoe box and grew to a bigger box and then you get one day you thought oh i need a file cabinet and then pretty soon you outgrow that file cabinet and then you're building a whole room and then the room's not big enough and then you build a fireproof room which is what i have done um, i've got some pictures of my vault uh, that's what we call it at home it's a vault it's a uh, double wall plywood or double wall drywall on the outside uh, it's got independent heat and air conditioning independent electrical system so everything's by itself it's got you can walk completely around the room so it's not a room that's against the wall there's another wall behind it so you can completely surround the room and uh, the fire department's about three quarters of a mile away and it's got a two hour rating on the room and if they can't get there in two hours we got bigger problems so i've got everything in a fireproof room i'll show you a couple pictures of what I've got here. These are all, uh, these uh, would be the horizontal file cabinets are all ones that came out of a dentist office or doctor's office. They, they're very handy, they're heavy, but they'll hold a lot. Uh, so I've got several sections of those. In that room, I have all my microfish and people think those microfish aren't good anymore. I still use mine every week. So I've got one of those in there, and you can pick those up at an auction for usually a dollar a piece anymore. Yeah. It's another shot of my, uh, my vault. This is the filing system I use. Everything is in hanging file folders. Well, not everything, but portions of it are. So that's how it's displayed by year, so it's easy to find. These are all the implement IT product guides and the red books and some of those books. Those all hang individually. Oh, I thought I had them right here. If you've all got the file folders, you know how they've got the metal bar inside of them. Well, I started ripping the metal bars here. I started ripping the metal bars out and you use those just insert them in the middle and they just hang they just hang there They're very handy well I found the company that manufactures these it stamps them out up in Chicago so I buy them by the like a 30 pound box of them but then you don't have to tear them out of anything and so that's what I use to hang everything I hang all my manuals that way you can see those books are held that way it doesn't damage the book at all These are some manuals, and as you can see, all the little wire brackets there. Every one of them has an insert right in the middle of it. This is, uh, the first two sections are just sales literature for Oliver, because that is my main, that's my main focus. I wouldn't say focus, it started out that way. My grandfather was an Oliver dealer. Dad's name's Oliver, he was an Oliver dealer. That's where I grew up. So Oliver is all I knew for a long time. Uh, I have expanded, as you can see in the third section, those are all IH books. These uh, wooden bookshelves that I bought, those came out of a uh, library. And if you look around, there's a place in St. Louis that has them. It's called Warehouse of Stuff. And you can buy those pretty darn cheap. And they're very strong, they're solid oak and they work really good in the library. And I like them because if it gets late at night, I can crawl up on top of there and just put a pillow and just fall asleep. So. Uh, these are annual reports. I've got them all in folders by year. The, the first, uh, first section and a half is all Oliver. And then the others, as you can see, I've got annual report miscellaneous, Alice Chalmers, Clee Track, IH, John Deere, and I collect those because as I'm writing stories, I can go in there and research and see what everybody was doing in 1977. I can see who introduced something new, uh, where they were financially, what their forecast was for the next year. So while annual reports don't mean much out here to a lot of people, to me, I really like them. And I buy all I can buy. Uh, as I said, independent, heat and air conditioning unit inside there. 
Uh, you want to keep the humidity in a room where there's paper. Uh, you want to keep the temperature about 70 degrees and the humidity uh, around 60%. So this is what I use to control just this room. And that's all of that. So what I thought I'd show you next is how to identify Alice, Ch or Alice Chalmers. I'm not at the Alice Chalmers, I know that. <laughs> At the, uh, how to identify IH literature. Does everybody under, Does anybody know how to uh, do the codes on the back of the literature? A few of you do. I brought a chart here that I'm going to hand out if anybody wants one. I can figure it. There it is. Full screen. Okay, the camera's showing on the computer, but it's not showing up here. Any ideas? <laughs> Maybe. We'll just have to wait. I'm going to read it off and you guys can tell me what year this is then. Okay, since some of you may know I fly, so I started collecting literature that is airplane tugs by tracker companies. So I picked up three of them out here. Uh, we'll go with this piece. It starts out AD. No, well, we know it's not 1911. AD. Well, here we are. First two letters are AD. Five three one nine. I picked a piece that isn't going to work for us. <laughs> well, 
let's try this. This is AD. And then the code is 3223 followed by an S. So this would be, first two letters are AD, so it's 1966. That's what this piece is going to be. Maybe this will work. Up at the top right here. And this list is provided by Paul Hebert. I think most of you know Paul Hebert. He's a Missouri paper boy. So this comes from him, so I trust it 100%. Uh, this is AD 5913, which 5913 is just going to be the, uh, the form number for this piece. And then it's followed by a B. So it's an AD it's followed by a B, 1973. Oh, that's a 747, too. So that's how you can identify the years of your literature. Let's go with this piece here. This is also an AD 3990U. That's not, oh there it is, 1968. 1968. If the first two letters are AD and then it's got a U on it, Oh, so it's going to be 1968. Oh, this one. Because the U at the bottom, 1988, you know that's not an 88. That was a 4100 in it. Some of this is a little bit of guesswork and common sense of knowing when stuff was built. But that, that chart will help you find out what year your literature is. Uh, let's try one more. This is a hillside combine piece. And this starts out AD, a series of numbers followed by an H. H is going to be 1979. If you go down, you're in the right row where it starts AD. I'm going to just keep on going down because we're down to an H. H is 1979. So that'll help you when you're arguing with somebody about when a tractor was built. You can pull up the literature and show them what year it was. Um, as I showed you earlier, there's a lot of different ways to store literature. A few things that I use for postcards. I've got these little books right here. You can pick these up at any most of your craft stores. Um, I usually pick mine up at Michael's in the art department. So you can pick those up and that'll keep your postcards safe and a good way to display them. They come in all sizes, these little black books. They're called art books. But I've got, this is a larger format one. You can put newspaper ads in here. And they're kept nice and flat and dry. And so I've got a lot of these. He's come in very handy. Also available at Michael's. For some of my magazines, this is acid-free paper. It's acid-free boxes for archival, rest, or, uh, archival storage. It'll keep things from turning yellow and keep them safe. I keep my farm quarterly magazines in here. And I've got them on the shelf. I put the year on them, what's in there, and the year on it. So when you walk in my room, it's, it's pretty organized. I wish my house was as good as this. But for sales literature, sales literature, I use three ring binders. Um, I didn't bring a good example. Yeah, this one works. Three ring binders, you can put them in these poly sleeves. You know out here you buy a lot of literature, it's in the poly sleeves. Uh, try to get the ones that are archival so that they're, they don't have acid in them that's going to change the paper or affect the paper in any way. When you're buying binders, if you fill them full of literature like I do, uh, the best ones to get are the ones with a D-ring. This one doesn't have a D-ring, but it's off to the side instead of in the center. And if you get them off to the side, it's easier on them when you're turning the pages. Because if you got them in the middle, you know how it is when you get to the end, you've got them, they're all bent over like this. So a D-ring, or make sure the rings are 
off to the side of the book, not in the bind itself. Those are the best binders to find. So you can use those. Uh, this is not a good one because it's in the middle. And I should have shown that. Of course, it doesn't work now, but these aren't the best to have. But I keep a lot of my photographs in here. These are old, vintage, and they're nice and safe, protected, dry. Those are ways to, to store things. Uh, a few more. These come in handy if you want to take magazines and store your magazines in a binder. You take these. center of the magazine goes right through there and you can put them in a three ring binder where they're safe and protected. <coughs> so you can pick these up. I know you can get them at Walmart and some of the other craft stores. But, uh, those work as well. <coughs> there are poly sleeves you could get. These are archival postcard sleeves. If you don't want to put them in a book like I had, you can put them in here. They're acid free. They'll protect your, protect your literature. Uh, there's all kinds of bags you can get. I guess the main thing you need to look for is stuff that's acid free or archival because it will affect the paper. Um, Here's some different sleeves. I think I brought a gloss. Yeah, that's a matte finish. So it's not shiny. It doesn't reflect when you're trying to look at it. It's easier on your eyes. If you're trying to look through stuff. Or you got the gloss ones. I, I really prefer the matte, but that's just a preference. There are different ways to restore literature. There are people who think that uh, you got in a barn and you find some literature and the pages are all stuck together and you just want to throw it away. And most people do, uh, but don't. There are ways to uh, save literature. And I'm going to show you a few examples. worked on those. Did anybody go to the seminar that I did in Illinois last year? Oh good. Oh there were a couple of you. Okay. Well these aren't stuck together because of that seminar so <laughs> yeah, this is stuck together. So what I'm going to do this is a spun polyester, put it in there. This is warm water in here. And in here is a concoction of Everclear. <laughs> Everclear and water. Um, grain alcohol, for whatever reason, with all the studies I've done, uh, you spray the paper down first with that, and it helps, uh, it helps absorb water and not hurt the paper. So, spray this down. <coughs> Just put it in the water. And we're just going to let it sit for a while. We've got another one here. This one is stuck together. You got wet on the bottom. And you would think that's junk. Most people would throw it away. I don't mind finding wrinkled literature. It's cheaper. I can go home and iron it, clean it. It's like laundry day in the vault. <laughs> <coughs> I 
And I hope this works. If not, <laughs> come back to the seminar tomorrow. I'll try some more. <laughs> It's one of those things that always works until somebody's watching. <laughs> so while that's soaking, I'll show you some other methods of uh, repairing literature. Turn this on. There are a lot of different ways to clean and repair literature. Uh, I went over a while ago. I told somebody I need I need some dirty literature and they looked at me funny. <laughs> so I had a camera here and it's not working with our projector, so we're just gonna have to wing it. <coughs> this is literature that's dirty. Uh, a lot of times, because this is plastic, if I was at home, I would probably just take uh, Fantastic or 409 or something and clean it like that. But if this was a leatherette or vinyl. Now, or the leatherette, the older I age stuff, you wouldn't want to do that with that. So what you take is an, it's a sponge, it's a cleaning sponge made specifically for uh, cleaning literature and paper. And you can see it's dirty up here because I've been using it. Go down here. And because this is plastic, it's not going to work real good. You can see it's bringing up dirt. And it also works on paper. Oh, here's some really dirty stuff. But you can use this on the, oh, cleans it up. It's, it's, I'll let you guys feel this a little later. Uh, there are other ways. This is a product <coughs> called Absorbine. It's almost like Silly Putty. <coughs> And it's just, it's just like, it's like silly putty, and you just get it all warm in your hands and knead it a little bit. And you can use this to clean paper. It'll pick up stuff that's inside the fibers. It even gives it a different feel. It puts some of the moisture back in it. Because although it's good to have dry paper, it can be too dry. It can get dry and brittle. And you've probably picked up posters that have been rolled up or um, things that are folded up and you think they're ruined. If you'll get them out, I didn't want to bring the iron and ironing board. Maybe I'll do that tomorrow. But you can take them and put the iron setting on low, but use the, uh, we call it the mister. Steamer. <laughs> the loss for words. You can use a steamer setting on it and go a few inches above the paper and just go around and steam it and then iron it, steam it a little more, and you'll get moisture back into it. And when you're all done, it, it will be smooth paper. Uh, obviously, don't leave it on there too long so you've got a black shape on there. Uh, you keep the iron moving. Uh, don't completely soak it. And just steam it a little bit. And you'll be really surprised how you can preserve a poster or any literature. Uh, I've got a piece here that, that I soaked last year. You know, these are two that are stuck together. But as wrinkled as this is, I can take this and steam it and iron it, and it will still it'll be nice and flat. So if you tell your wife you're going to go iron your literature, she may look at you funny, but... And maybe the only time she sees you use an iron, too. <laughs> Might be a bad thing. <laughs> She'll be like, wow, you're at it. <laughs> but this is just one of those products that you can use to clean paper, and it'll get down in, the, in that uh, leatherette stuff. It'll reach down in there. Um, if you have mold, the best thing to use on mold Try and brush it off lightly, and then you take a solution of half hydrogen peroxide and half water. And you just dip a little sponge or something in it. Don't soak it, just get it a little damp, 
and wipe it down with that and the hydrogen peroxide water mixture will, will kill the, the mold in it. And uh, you can also use the hydrogen peroxide for uh, uh, cleaning up stains in literature. It doesn't work all the time. Some of our stains are really old stains, but you can brush it on lightly, dry it off, brush it again, and a lot of times it'll turn it back to white, just like it'll do hydrogen peroxide in your teeth and things like that. So that's one of the, another one of the cleaning products. And all these products are available. I've got a couple catalogs here. You can order them online. You can get most of them on Amazon. You know the name for them. But there are two companies that specialize in archival uh, and restoration materials, and you can order anything from them. Oh, here's another cleaning pad. This is one I use too. This one works really good on just paper. And it's like a little pillow, but it's, it's full of... Uh, it's not sawdust, I'm not real sure what it is, but you, you rub it around and then when you get it on there, it's all coated now. And you just rub that grit around. And I know you can't see it, but it's all dirty. It's dirty grit now, it's picked up, it's absorbed all the dirt and uh, what's inside there. Put it on there. It's hard to tell because I didn't do it very long, but there's a nice, there's a cleaner spot right there in the middle just from using that. It's kind of like oil dry. Huh? It's kind of like oil dry. Yeah, yeah, it is. It really is. It's probably quite. <laughs> um, I'm going to pass that around. <laughs> oh, oh, look at that. Now you got it all over your <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> That's all right. Well, your pants will be clean now. <laughs> uh, I was going to show you a way to preserve your posters after you've done your ironing. A lot of people will take a poster and laminate it. That's the worst thing you can do for them. It really is. That laminating material is going to get through the years. It's going to change colors. It's going to crack. <laughs> and you'll never get that poster back out of there. Uh, the best way to do that is uh, just to take the poster itself, put it on a poster board. And this little machine right here is a good idea. How many of you belong to chapters? And they're all looking for a way to raise money. This is a good way to raise money. Just buy one of these machines, go to a show, and let people know in advance to bring their posters and you can laminate, or it's not laminating, it's sealing their posters for them, and you can make some money there at the show, and you'll be doing something nobody else there is doing. They just have to know ahead of time so they can bring it with them. <coughs> it's a very easy process. Even a girl can do it. You can get this done at uh, like Kinko's and some of the printing places. But personally, I don't like to leave my valuable paper with anybody. I mean, you take it up there, you don't know. That kid behind the counter, to him, it's just a piece of paper. I think I need three hands here. Come here, help me. Not. I'm trying to sell the idea to you on a chapter function. I'm not making it look very good. <laughs> Got it now. Okay. Now you do. It's on heat. Hopefully it's hot enough. <coughs> you hear it click. And then it just pulls right off it. Of 
And you want to seal the other edge. It doesn't have to be done very neatly. I'll show you why in a minute. <coughs> and it will seal it inside of here. That doesn't look very pretty, but we're not done. So you take this fancy little label remover. I'm just going to do one corner because you don't need to sit here and watch me do it all. But you see how nice and nice and smooth that is. And it's preserved and protected. Hang it on the wall. Do whatever you want to do it. That's one way of uh, protecting these. I see some of them framed out there. Framed them is a good way to. Uh, again, I'd make sure you get uh, archival plastic or glass to go over it. Um, light is not good on these things, which brings up another point. In my vault, all of my fluorescent bulbs are covered with this. This is a UV protectant plastic film. Uh, you can buy this at the archival stores. Just wrap your bulbs with it. And you don't have to worry about the rays from your bulbs hurting any of your literature. Uh, I guess we can see if this is Two become, one becomes two, came right apart. So then what you're gonna wanna do, you have to be careful when they're wet. Most of the time, this is on here, I've got too much in here, but normally you would pick it up with this so you're not handling it and you don't risk tearing it in any way. <clears throat> bring the literature over and you just pat it dry. 